So, I am so excited for us uh, being over here today. This is the most consequential innovation that we have done at Cisco in the past 40 years in cybersecurity. And I can't wait to share this with you. And uh, welcome to everyone over here at the McLaren facility. Welcome to everyone who's going to be uh, um, dialed in from all around the world. And what I thought we'd do is, before we get started on what we are talking about over here, I'd walk you through a little bit of a macro view on what we see happening in the industry. So if you think about the past several thousand years, we've all lived in a world of scarcity, extreme scarcity. And what that means in practical terms is all of us have a very, very constrained set of resources. And every year, uh, our management uh, asks us to do a little bit more with just a little bit less. Right? And we've been doing this now for, um, for many, many years. I think this is the first time that we as a society are going to enter into this age of abundance. And what I mean by the age of abundance is that uh, specifically the amount of capacity that we can augment uh, to what we are currently doing is actually going to go at a very, very fast pace. So suppose you had 20 developers in your team, getting that to 100 developers is going to be a whole lot easier than what we could do in the past. Suppose you had 40 customer service agents, you could actually get those 40 to a whopping 250 in a very, very compressed amount of time. And these, this addition is going to be through digital workers. And by the way, it's not just in IT domains. I think what's going to happen, frankly, is uh, every single time someone joins a new company, they might have an employee benefits package, and that employee benefits package is going to essentially have um, you know, six or seven assistants that everyone gets. Everyone might have a personal assistant, everyone might have a HR assistant, everyone's gonna have some kind of financial assistant, everyone's gonna have a personal concierge, someone's, people are gonna have a coach. And so those kind of augmentation of um, skills are gonna be made available to all of us so that we can do more on a daily basis. And so what's, what's gonna, what it's gonna do is it's gonna meet, make the world of eight billion people feel like we have the capacity of 80 billion people, right? Now, the question that you might ask is, where is this additional capacity going to sit? And this additional capacity is actually going to sit in data centers, right? And they are going to be sitting in data centers which are going to operate at a very different scale proportion than what we've actually seen them operate today. And they're going to be in both public data centers and they're going to be in private data centers. And each one of those data centers will have to accommodate for this additional digital worker population that needs to be factored in on how they go out and scale the data centers. So as a result, because of the scale proportion differential, data centers are going to need to be fundamentally reimagined. Right? And you know, Cisco has been at the heart of helping reimagine these data centers and helping operate these data centers, where if you think about the way that they're connected, the way in which they're secured, the way in which they're operated, the way in which they're run, we've actually had a fair amount of experience in going helping customers, both hyperscalers as well as enterprise data centers, actually um, be connected and protected. But 
um, we're going to need to think about a very, very different type of infrastructure that's going to be needed to go out and support these data centers that are going to operate at a very different scale proportion. And I'm not just talking about a single data center. I'm talking about a web of data centers that we're going to have that are connected to each other, and they're all going to need to operate as one. So what we've been thinking about very deeply at Cisco is what do we do to make sure that we fundamentally help with this reimagining of data centers? And uh, recently, I had a conversation with our, um, um, our CEO, Chuck Robbins, who, um, and we were, we, were, we were talking about this, and I figured I'd kind of make sure that um, he had a chance to, um, to talk to all of you. And so let's, um, let's roll uh, the video. Hello, Chuck. How are you Chuchu? doing? Good, how are you? So the audience just heard a lot about you know, the changing role of the data center in the age of AI, and um, uh, you've been talking to a lot of customers. Tell us a little bit about your perspective of what's happening from a Cisco lens uh, with, um, with AI. Well, first of all, I think the two most pressing items that we talk to customers about right now are AI and security. I mean, these are the, these are the things that every customer is concerned about, and there's, there's this interesting intersection because AI is actually going to make the threat actors more effective, harder to see, yep. harder, to, uh, harder to catch. And so every customer is trying to figure out, A, what's my AI, what, what, how do I get to what I want to get to from an AI strategy perspective? So what's the execution path? Yep. And the second thing they're worried about is what does my cyber footprint look like in this new world as we move forward? And those are just two of the big conversations we're having. And in, in that area, can you talk a little bit about the role that you think infrastructure and networking and connectivity play with AI? Well, if you think about AI, th there's, there's a need to build sort of an underlying AI fabric right. that actually is, is made up of really robust infrastructure that's moving the traffic between GPUs and moving inference data at, to the right spot. So you've got infrastructure, you have to have security, which I think you're talking about a little bit. We are. Uh, you need a data platform, right? And we have all three of those, and you have to have observability so you can see what's going on and when there's a problem, et cetera. And we have all four, so we think there's a unique opportunity to create this next generation fabric that's made up of all of those four things that really help our customers seamlessly deploy advanced AI apps. Frankly, the fact that they're you know, loosely coupled, tightly integrated, yeah. is going to be hugely beneficial for customers. I don't think there's any other company that I can think of that actually has a combination of that. I don't either, and I think that if you look at our secure networking solutions that we've been coming out with, these are examples of what we're going to do to bring these technologies together to really help our, help our customers as we move forward. How do you think about um, Cisco security in the age of AI and how, yeah. how we should be uh, kind of thinking about building for the next, uh, next wave? Well, I think the most important thing for our customers to know is we're 120% committed, 150% committed. And if you recall, we had a conversation with our entire leadership team, and, yeah. and we all agreed this was the most important thing for us to go invest in. And in fact, some of your peers actually gave funding to, so that we could actually invest more. I think we realized we'd been underinvested, and uh, and there was a lot of work we needed to do in the portfolio. And I think under your leadership and then under the teams that have been brought in, the, these new leaders that you have, some of the acquisitions that you've made, the team's fantastic. Uh, I think it, um, you've been delivering on innovation at a faster pace than we ever have. And I think it's important for the customers to know that, A, we're listening to them uh, around what it is they need. We're also going to be consulting with them to try to share ideas about how we think we can help them best defend themselves. And uh, that we're going to continue to innovate and drive security in a very integrated way because it's the only way our customers can actually solve this problem. And this is one of the big reasons we acquired Splunk. right? Yep. Because at the end of the day, so many of our customers said to me, I can't continue to throw more humans at this problem. Yep. I need an automated platform that's actually finding these threats, finding what's going on in my infrastructure, and then with AI now, we can actually do that at a, at a pace and scale that we couldn't before. So I think uh, it's pretty exciting. I think over the next few years, we're going to do some great stuff with our customers. It, it's going to be great, Chuck. And if you think about the way that this industry has evolved over the course of the past 30 years, mm -hmm. the advantage has always been uh, in the adversary's court because yeah. they have to be right once. You as a defender so have to be right every single time. I think this is probably the first time uh, that you will, you might see the scale tip towards the, um, the the benefit of the defender, but that's only because they'll have a data advantage, and I think we'll hopefully go out and create that for them. 
Well, I mean, that's that's what they want us to do, and that's yeah. what we need to do, because you're right. They still only have to be right once. Um, exactly. But we also have moved away over the years from from just having a perimeter-based security strategy, because we, we know they're good. They're going to get in. Yep. How do you block them and keep them from getting to important assets when they're in? And yep. These are important strategies that have evolved that I think are super uh, key to our, our defense with our customers. Um, and then having the uh, the ability to uh, also, you know, automate and, and and notify the customers when there are things right. going on. And I think just having the ability to correlate multiple data points, because you can see three events happening, and individually they mean you might nothing. Ignore all of them, but yeah. but the three at the same time tell you there's a big problem. And I think yeah. that's the beauty of an automated platform with all the right data. And as you said, even when you think about AI, uh, in in past times, in many cases. It, super advanced technologies help smaller companies catch incumbents. Yep. In this case, I think those with the most data and the most organized data and the best strategy to utilize that data are going to win, and I think yeah. that's important. It's it's so true. And security, yeah, the way I say it, think about it is it is a data game. It like is the one who has most data wins. So, Chuck, any closing thoughts for our audience over here? Yeah, I think first of all, I just want to thank everybody for spending time with us today. And whether you're live in person or you're tuning in, we really appreciate the partnership. I want to thank you all for your help along this journey and a lot of feedback and input they've given. I know you engage with a lot of these customers quite regularly, G2, we on do. getting their feedback as we're going through the development iteration process. Uh, and finally, I just want to say that we really hope that you'll allow us to partner with you uh, as our customers on building out this secure fabric and on this journey towards utilizing AI for whatever it is that you want to use it for in the future. We really, really want to be your partner. Thank you. So that was, um, thank you. That was Chuck Robbins. By the way, if any of you are wondering, I know I had a lot of feedback from my team on my choice of wardrobe in that interview. And so <laughs> it, was, um, it was well noted. <laughs> you were wondering? Okay, there was someone who was wondering as well. Um, I was trying to get a more casual vibe, but clearly that didn't work. But as we, um, as we talked about earlier, I think data centers are fundamentally changing and they're going to be changing in two specific ways. And I think we need to make sure that we first understand how they're changing and then what do we need to do from a security standpoint to go out and address those changes um, that will have some challenges that have emerged as a result of those changes. So firstly, they're changing because the infrastructure in, data ch in, in, in the data centers is fundamentally changing. And two, the applications are changing. So let's go into each one of these areas in a little bit more detail. So if you think about the infrastructure changing, the computational systems that used to be used in the past were largely for general purpose computing. And you know they were very, very good at um, uh, doing sequential processing, and those were CPUs. right? And now what you've started seeing is there's far more specialization in computational systems where not just CPUs, but you now also have GPUs, and you also have DPUs. The GPUs, graphics processing units, um, were largely you know, for parallel processing, vector math, matrix math. Um, and if you think about what it was able to do, like you were able to take a thousand pixels and convert it in a single operation from red to green. And it so turns out that that, that kind of mechanism for parallel processing was also very, very useful for AI workloads, right? And so you see this kind of massive upsurge of, um, of AI workloads. What you've also seen is acceleration happening through DPUs, which are data processing units, and these DPUs are largely uh, you know, subsystems specialized for I.O. operations. You know, so any kind of repeated network connectivity, you might have connection management or encryption. Those are the kind of things that it actually specializes in. And you can start to see that the, the speed and performance of these subsystems tends to actually go out and really help us um, get far lower latency and far more that we can do with the systems than what you could do in the past. Now, the scale proportion, basically, of data centers is fundamentally changing in very, very different ways. And I'll give you one example that was staggering when I heard about it, which is if you think of uh, a single rack of GPUs, the bandwidth it has is greater than the mobile network of all of North America. Think about that for just a moment, right? A single rack. And so what this means from a connectivity fabric perspective is that the, uh, a delay in a packet by a few milliseconds getting to where it needs to get to actually has far greater ripple effects and consequences than what we might have experienced before. 
right? And so you need to have a, a very, very different way of making sure that the latency is reduced, the performance is increased. Now, that's what's happening on the infrastructure side. What's happening on the application side? Well, on the application side, if many of you might remember the three-tiered architectures that used to be around, we have now moved from three-tier architectures to far more of a microservices architecture, where you don't have three tiers, but you might have 300 microservices, or you might have 3,000 microservices, and they all sit in multiple microservices, might sit on a, hardware, uh, on a single piece of hardware. You might have, uh, they typically sit in containers or in virtual machines, and you have clusters of these Kubernetes contain containers where some of them are allowed to talk to others, but you want to make sure that they don't talk to the, another set of kind of clusters. So when you start thinking about it, a payments cluster, it's okay if the payments cluster talks to the shopping cart cluster, but you, you don't want it to talk to your developer cluster. And so the way in which you go and apply security needs to actually start being thought about very differently than the way that we've been doing it over the course of the past many years, right? And so we have to fundamentally reimagine security, and this isn't something that's way out in the future. You have to reimagine it starting now. now the question that you might ask is, what's actually changing in security that's so foundational? And what's happening in security? And all of you folks know about this. Um, you know, you, you're all experts on the security side. But here's, here's something that's really interesting that's going on, is the amount of time that it takes from the time that a vulnerability is announced in the market to when an exploit happens is now gotten to single-digit days. That's compressed to single-digit days. And in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if that compressed to hours or minutes when that started happening, right? But the time that it takes, for, the average amount of time that it takes for a patch to be applied on a vulnerability is about between 25, if you're lucky, and 49 days. So when you start seeing this, there's actually a huge gap between when something is announced and how long you're exposed before you've actually protected yourself with the patch. Right? And why is this, and why is, why is this happening, and what, what can we be doing to make sure that you solve this problem so that you are not as much at risk and exposed as we've, um, we are today as a society? And by the way, when there's critical infrastructure and you're at risk, there's, there's pretty massive human consequences to this. Right? And one of the things we found is, you know, securing everything is really hard. And the way that security systems were built largely in the past was you were built so that you could have users effectively connect to applications. And now where you are is you don't just have users connecting to applications, you have applications talking to applications, you have a bunch of IoT devices, and it's not just a few hundred, it's not just a few thousand, it's not just a few million, it might be billions or trillions of IoT devices that are all talking to each other. And we need to make sure that we can actually have those be effectively connected uh, in the right ways. So there's three key problems that we've seen organizations have that actually cause and warrant for security to be fundamentally reimagined. And so the first one of those problems is, if you assume that the attacker is already in the system, it's really hard to go out and contain an attack from spreading through lateral movement, right? And the way that you typically do it is through segmentation. And segmentation is actually really hard. Now, the way that segmentation used to work was you had a tier of an application that, that ran on a dedicated piece of hardware, and so segmentation was a whole lot easier. And now, when you're in this world of microservices, you've got thousands of microservices that are talking to each other uh, across public cloud and private cloud. Um, and the way in which you go about segmenting things at that scale can tend to be very difficult. And by the way, segmenting is essential because you have to isolate an attacker uh, when they're in there to protect, to prevent, you know, lateral movement. So that's the first challenge that you have, is segmentation is really hard. The second challenge is what we talked about. Patching is really hard. You've got this gap on patching where the time that it takes for a vulnerability to be exploited is far shorter and actually compressing, while the speed of patching is not, act not, is not accelerating any. And it's complicated to do it. Uh, it's even harder. It's, it's one thing to go out and patch your infrastructure in your data center, 
But now you start thinking about what goes beyond that needs to be patched. Imagine if you actually had to patch an oil rig. Imagine if you had to patch an MRI machine. Imagine if you had to patch um, an IoT device like a drone. Imagine if you had to do something with a robot welder. Those might not even be designed to effectively uh, be able to efficiently patch. So how do you go about solving that problem? And by the way, these are all solvable problems. They just have to have a very different way that you approach solving the problem. You can't do it the way that we've been doing it in the past. The third challenge, which is a pretty um, you know, universal challenge, I'm sure that all of you folks will, um, will, will, will relate to this, is that upgrading your infrastructure is really hard. And one of the big challenges and exposures we have is dated infrastructure is one of the huge risks for critical infrastructure that can actually be exploited and exposed, right? Now, why is upgrading infrastructure really hard? Because you typically have a couple change control windows. Those change control windows might be at, at, at very, very compressed in time. Depending on the business you're in, they're either during the holidays or not during the holidays. And, um, you know, what ends up happening with this is, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, we had, a firewall business, and that firewall business had some issues in quality years ago, and we've actually fixed those, those challenges, but the number of customers that have upgraded to that new version has taken a long time, right? So upgrading tends to be very hard, and this is something that's a universal problem. So we got to solve these problems in different ways, and these are all, in our opinion, very, very solvable problems. But they weren't able to be easily solved because I think there's some core essential building blocks that simply weren't available in the past that are now going to allow us to completely reimagine what the solutioning could be, right? And the way I think about this is imagine if Amazon.com was started in the year 1575. Like it would be an epically failed company because you didn't have the PC revolution you didn't have the internet revolution. You didn't have the sophistication of the logistics infrastructure. Um, you wouldn't have actually been able to succeed. So it's, it's very important that the core technology building blocks have to be in place for the timing to be right for something to actually be built that's meaningful on top of all of that. And we think that there's three key technology building blocks that are going to be essential in going out and solving some of those problems for these AI scale data centers. Right? And what are those three key building blocks? The first one is this technology called eBPF, and I'll walk you through what that is in just a moment. The second area is hardware acceleration, and the third is AI. Let me walk you through each one of this in just a moment. So eBPF, what eBPF is, if you think about what we need to do from a, um, uh, a, a pure strategic standpoint, on if you need to secure something, you have to have a tremendous amount of visibility in what you want to secure. If you don't have visibility, you can't secure, right? In order to go out and have the right level of solves of these problems in a hyper-distributed architecture, what you need to have is a level of knowledge on what's going on inside of your operating system. And what eBPF does, if you assume that traffic is encrypted end-to-end, -end, and if you assume that the endpoint is already compromised, you need to make sure that on the server, you have some visibility in what's happening in the guts of the operating system. And what eBPF does is it's an agent that sits in user space but has a kernel level effect that can observe every single I.O. operation, that can observe every single process that gets kickstarted, that allows us to make sure that we can actually have the visibility that's needed. Now, the company that co-created eBPF, and we'll talk a lot about this um, you know, in, a, in, in a few minutes, but the company that co-created eBPF is a company called iSurveillant, and they co-created eBPF with Meta. And the great part about this is eBPF as a technology is used by many of the large-scale companies like Netflix and Meta and Google and Cloudflare. And what we've seen is that, you know, uh, this is a remarkable technology that allows you to have multiple distributed enforcement points and have a lot of kind of visibility in what's happening inside the kernel. Right? The good news is eBPF is an open source technology, and iSurveillance actually um, had initiated uh, an open source distribution 
of, um, of Cilium. By the way, we recently bought Isovalent just a few days ago, and so now that's part of Cisco, and is actually going to be a very, very strategic asset on top of which we can do some very meaningful stuff, right? Isovalent had this open source distribution called Cilium. Now, the interesting part about Cilium, for EB, which is the open source distribution of eBPF, is that it is the third most contributed open source project that currently exists. If you look at a GitHub repo, um, if you look at just the activity that's happening in the GitHub repo, the first two are Kubernetes itself and OpenTelemetry. Now, many of you might be familiar that Splunk is the largest contributor for OpenTelemetry, and Isovalent is the largest contributor for Cilium. And Cisco owns both Splunk and Isovalent. And so we are very committed to making sure that we continue to keep investing in open source as we, as we move forward. Now, Isovalent was built largely for the public cloud. And what we've actually wanted to do is make sure that we continue to keep investing in the public cloud and in the hyperscalers, but take that same technology and accelerate the extension of that to the private cloud. Because once we do that, we can now, which basically means that you're able to run EVPF on VMs, right? And what this is going to do is allow us to do some things in a very interesting way that just weren't possible before. And what this should tell you as a message is, one, we are all in on open source, and two, we are all in on cloud protection. But that's a core technology building block that's important for us to understand, on top of which we're going to be building some of the other pieces. All right, so what's the second building block? Hardware acceleration. And when I talk about hardware acceleration, I'm specifically, in this particular case, talking about the DPUs or the data processing units, which are the subsystems I talked about earlier that allow you to go and accelerate repetitive network tasks like connection management, encryption, so on and so forth, right? Any kind of I.O. operation. And what you'll see over here is that we are going to be processing network traffic at very different speeds than what we were able to process before. And we'll be able to have advanced security processing at very different scale proportions that we could have ever imagined before because of this hardware acceleration that you're seeing. Now, the beauty about this is if you imagine a distributed world, you want to make sure that you take security to where uh, what needs to be protected. So you take the security to the workload rather than the other way around. What we're doing on that front is making sure that this DPU, if you can have this DPU sit on any server, or it can also sit on a switch or a router, on top of rack switch or a router. You might now have multiple enforcement points for security between eBPF and the DPU at multiple different places. And this starts to, what I'm sharing over here is you might start to think about the architecture for security itself getting fundamentally reimagined for the AI scale data center. This is not just another feature. This is not just another capability. It is a fundamental reimagining of the architecture, right? And the third area, of course, is AI. Now, what if, rather than having AI as a bolt-on, we actually thought about AI being built natively in the products, from the ground up? In the, from the time that the idea was conceived, you thought about how AI was going to go out and fundamentally change the way that that actually operated. You know, um, could there be a possibility that we could prevent an exploit before a patch was applied because we were able to do something creative with AI? Could there be a way that we could automate it in an automatic manner, um, accelerate the testing and deployment of patching based on some of the challenges that we talked about earlier? And would there be a way that if you had multiple distributed enforcement points that all of them stay hyper-coordinated? AI and the automation that that brings could actually make this be very different than the, way the, 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 than the world that we've lived in in the past. And as all of us have seen, AI is an industry where you cannot do it all by yourself. You have to make sure that you partner extensively with the ecosystem. And so I'm delighted that we're going to be extending our partnership with NVIDIA, where we'll actually be building very specific security models with AI. And we'll also make sure that we'll have our technology work 
very well with what NVIDIA is going out and building themselves so that their, um, their new innovations that they have, we'll make sure that our technology works very well with them. So you'll hear a little bit more from NVIDIA a little bit later. But that's a very strategic partnership for us. But the reality is, is these building blocks really help us imagine a solution for the world that's very different from the one that we've actually wanted in the past. But it's not enough. You also need a platform. And why do you need a platform? Because if you look at the past 30 or 40 years, security as an industry has largely been innovated by patchwork. Every single time there's a new threat, there's a new vendor that comes in to go out and address that threat. Consequently, we've got about 3,500 vendors in the market. No one owns more than 15% of the market. Each one of you manage 50 to 70 different products within your cybersecurity stack if you're lucky. Right? If you're larger, you probably have 100 to 150. That means that you have 50 to 70 policy engines, 50 to 70 different places where contention and policy might occur, 50 to 70 places where there's actually going to be heightened levels of complexity as you're starting to manage this. And it's simply not tenable as you move forward anymore. Now, this gets even further exacerbated as you go into a multi-cloud environment because every single one of the cloud providers has their own security stack. And if you have multiple cloud environments, you now have to go out and create security. Each one of them have a decent stack. It's not that the stack is bad. It's just, it's just different. And so you have to make sure that you make, make all of them work well in cohesion with one another. So we thought long and hard a few years ago, saying, what is the role that Cisco should play in this ecosystem that would actually create durable advantage for the customer? And what we heard from customers is, I like the public cloud economics, but I don't like the public cloud lock-in. So we said, what if you could abstract networking and security from the core infrastructure, you can acquire and steer any and all traffic to any of the cloud providers, and when you do, you can persist policy as your workload moves from one cloud to the other. And so we launched this thing called the Cisco Security Cloud and the Cisco Networking Cloud you know, in succession, one after the other. We launched the Cisco Security Cloud first and then the Networking Cloud, and that had Basically, it was an integrated platform that would have common login, common management, common policy engine, all those pieces. And it would do a few specific things for customers. What it would do is it would actually protect the user from a breach. It would protect cloud and cloud infrastructure from a breach. And it would actually make sure that if there was a breach that was occurring, you could go out and detect it in record time, in near real time, and make sure that you can respond, remediate, and recover from that breach as fast as possible. Right? And, that's, and all of that was, that was going to be built on a fabric of AI and a fabric of identity. Because right now, identity is actually a huge threat for most companies. Um, because most hackers are saying, well, why, why do I need to log in if I can? Well, why do I need to hack in if I can just log in? So you need to make sure that there's some intelligence with identity that's hydrating this kind of platform. But this was. The vision over here was to build an integrated platform that was built on top of the foundation of our firewall, right? And the beauty about this is, as you heard Chuck talk about it earlier, we really feel like security is a game of data. The one who's actually got better organized data is the one who's going to win. And so our acquisition of Splunk only supercharges this entire vision of an integrated platform. So the good news is we have all the building blocks of technology with eBPF, with hardware acceleration, uh, and with AI. And we've actually got the platform. And so this gives us an opportunity to reimagine security at a very different scale proportion than what we've been able to do in the past for the AI scale data center. Right? And this would, this would fundamentally get us much safer and increase the velocity with which we could do things. But the challenge over here is, this can't be the next generation of something that already exists. This has to be reimagined in such a way that it's the first generation of something completely new. And that's why we're so excited and we're so thrilled about this innovation, which we've been working on for a while. We've been, we've been waiting for this moment eagerly. Um, and this is the first time that we're announcing to the market the introduction of Cisco HyperShield. Well, it was a good time to clap. We're very excited. And what Cisco HyperShield is, is basically a highly distributed architecture for security that's cloud native and that's going to be operating at AI scale. 
across that highly distributed kind of um, architecture that we're talking about. And the team that's building this, they're just complete rock stars. And so rather than me belaboring it more, Tom Gillis, who is the head of our security business that came to us from VMware, who's a good friend of mine, um, has been the guy uh, with, along with his partner and CTO uh, who've actually been thinking about this in a big way. And so to talk to you more about that, can you please join me in welcoming Tom Gillis? Where is Tom? There. Right there. Thanks, G2. Take it away, buddy. Thanks, G2. Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for coming. There's some familiar faces, some new faces. I'm Tom Gillis. I'm the general manager for security products at Cisco. And as G2 said, it's, it's true. Uh, I came to Cisco because I think the industry needs a new approach to network security. And it's an approach that really only Cisco can deliver. And so we're really proud that today we're unveiling Cisco HyperShield. HyperShield is a security architecture that I believe will protect us for the next decade, which includes the scale of the AI scale data center. Now, what are we talking about with the AI scale data center? Well, we, the industry, have been through a transition like this before. Remember 15, 20 years ago, there was a few consumer websites that started with enterprise data centers, the same as the ones that you all run in your infrastructure. And they just got so big, they grew by an order of magnitude and then maybe even two orders of magnitude. And they realized, we can't take the same approach. So the way the typical enterprise data center has been operating is these are very high performance, highly engineered systems that would typically come in a box. And you could go into the data center and you could touch these boxes, right? And there was a box for a, a database server, which was different than a box for a web server, and there was a different box for a firewall and a different box for a load balancer, and you cabled all this stuff in Ethernet. So as these consumer sites began to scale, they realized, we've got to take a totally different approach. And so the first thing to change was the applications. G2 talked about this. No longer a three-tier web app, but you're now dealing with 300 or maybe 3,000 microservices. That's pretty well understood. But the second thing that had to scale was the infrastructure itself. And so these consumer websites were large enough, they had big software development teams, that they could take the infrastructure services, write them in software, and then spread them across this entire grid of compute. So if you look into the guts of a hyperscale data center, there are no appliances in there, or very few. Right? They're doing this scale-out, software-driven model. And so they had very large infrastructure engineering teams that could deliver this. At Cisco, we're taking that same infrastructure software, and we're building it so that every enterprise can embrace the architecture of the scale-out public cloud and be ready for the AI scale data center. So what this means is we're taking the functions of network security that used to come in a box, and it's like we're melting it into the network. We break it literally into 100,000, maybe a million little pieces, and we put security everywhere, right up close to the workload, right where you need it to be. So what this means is in the public cloud, we can sit next to VMs, to Kubernetes clusters. In a private cloud, we can live in software at the eBPF layer that Chichu was talking about, but we can also implement in a DPU that could be running in a server, and we can implement in an advanced hardware accelerator like a DPU that could be running in a top of rack switch. And so as we start to put advanced hardware acceleration into the fabric of the network, it allows us to extend from public and private workloads into edge workloads, IoT and OT. So think about a hospital environment where you've got a CAT scanner or a blood uh, analyzer. That's an application. It's running a Windows server or a Linux server, and that needs to be protected. You can put security right close to it at the switch port where it connects. So think about edge computing. Think about a factory environment where there's a robot welder. Having the ability to put security where you need it, we think this is going to be a transformative capability. Now, AI is clearly driving a revolution in the whole industry. G2 alluded to this earlier. If you're building a product from the beginning that assumes the power of AI, you can do some transformative things. Let me use an analogy that's a car analogy, since we're here at McLaren. If you remember the first generation of electric cars, what they did is they took a gas-powered car, pulled the gas engine out, and they put the electric drivetrain in place of the gas engine. And the problem with this is that an electric drivetrain, the batteries are very heavy. 
And so the weight was all concentrated in the front of the car where the engine typically was. But if you're building a car from the beginning to be electric, you put the batteries in a sheet on the floor. And this was one of the breakthroughs that Tesla did, is they built a car that was specifically meant to be electric. And so with the performance of a battery on the floor, you had not just better acceleration, you had better handling, better braking, and really it was better than its gas-powered cousin in almost every dimension. And so with Cisco HyperShield, we're bringing you the same equivalent in software. It's an AI native system that I don't think these capabilities were possible without the use of AI. And we're going to talk through how that implements. But there's a base platform which has some unique capabilities, including the ability to upgrade itself. And then there are modules that sit on top that solve specific problems, segmentation, protecting application vulnerabilities, all delivered in the cloud uh, management console. Now, this is a software subscription service that is independent of hardware. And we'll walk you through the details of how that operates. But as G2 said, this is not the next generation of something you already know. This is the first generation of something that's net new. Now, what's nice is that we, when I look around the room, there are some familiar faces here. The inspiration for this product has come from customers that we've worked with, in many cases I've known for a decade or more, that have solved real-world problems. There are three problems that I think we can solve with Cisco HyperShield that are fairly unique. The first one is segmentation. And segmentation, in my opinion, is a foundational capability, but it's still a little bit out of reach. So the idea behind segmentation is very straightforward. If you think about a high-profile attack on a credit rating agency in the US, this is now probably three or four years ago, they found a single instance of an Apache server that was not up to date. They landed code on that box, executed to root, and then from that one server, they made 48 lateral moves over the course of nine months. 48 lateral moves, right? And that's where they amassed 250 million credit cards. They didn't find that in a single place. They didn't find it on a laptop. It was the movement around the infrastructure that caused all the damage. So we want to put some basic boundaries in place to prevent the attacker from having the run of the tables. So this is not a new idea, and there are tools on the market that are designed to facilitate this. They'll do automatic formulation of segmentation policies. The challenge with those tools is that they don't have a deep understanding of the application. And so when they baseline the application, they use time as a criteria. So let's imagine you're baselining an app in a factory that does the scheduling of sheet metal delivery. And you watch the, observe this application for 90 days. You think, OK, I understand how it works. Until the factory runs out of sheet metal on day 91, and then it has to communicate with the ERP system and the scheduling system and the delivery system, right? That it's going to act in a way that appears random. And so the challenge with segmentation is that it's been a trial and error process. You hope you've actually characterized the system, but when, it's, when an application is apparently behaving randomly, it kind of looks like a big jump of a spaghetti. So for most customers, it can take as much as 40 days to segment and stabilize a policy for one application. How many applications do you all have in your infrastructure? Many times it's hundreds, 1,000, 2,000 applications. So segmentation just becomes an impractical task. Now, with AI, we can change this. So with Cisco HyperShield, we look at network flows the same way everyone else does. But because we can look into memory and we can understand the inner workings of the application, it allows us to see process level interaction. It allows us to see which version of the application is running. It allows us to understand the application and see, has anyone else segmented this? Right? So we can use a global population. It allows us to combine our knowledge of bad behavior that we get from our threat research team in Talos. And it allows us to continuously learn and update. So the way it works, it's almost the way a human being would work, which is, Let's start by just understanding all the stuff in your data center. Who's talking to who? How do these pieces connect? And then we begin to draw lines around it and say, yeah, let's separate dev from prod. Really big, kind of chunky segmentation. And then as we learn more about the application and our confidence grows, we can create tighter and tighter and tighter rings. But this is a continuous process. So if the application changes, if it gets an update, if it moves, the segmentation policies will relax until we learn more about the new behavior, and then we can tighten it back up again. So think of it as a dynamic system that is living and breathing. The good news here is we can deliver segmentation in your network at scale that actually works. Okay, That's the good news. The bad news is 
attackers are assuming you have segmentation in place. Attackers are getting very, very good at either stealing a credential or compromising the application itself and moving through legitimate application pathways. And we like to say, attackers have figured out it's easier to simply log in than it is to hack in. So, in order to stop these more sophisticated attacks that look like real behavior, you need to understand the services that make up the application and what those vulnerabilities are. And there was a very high profile attack that we saw in the US around a remote desktop utility. The issue was there was a URL and if you appended a certain string onto that URL, it allowed the attacker to get to root. And this had a huge impact on consumers. Now, that vulnerability was announced privately on February 13th. It was announced publicly on the 19th. So you had a fair amount of lead time to prepare. Three days after the public announcement of this vulnerability, this attack took place. And we're talking about a very sophisticated IT organization that understood the vulnerability, but we have to accept the reality, patching is hard. Patching takes time. And in some cases, as you heard in the video, you can't patch. You don't control the application that comes from a vendor, et cetera. So, what we do with HyperShield is we draw a picture of your entire inventory, and then we integrate with your existing vulnerability tools. So whatever you're using, Qualys, Red Seal, Tenable, Wiz, these are mature products that are very good at identifying vulnerabilities. In fact, they're so good, they give you a list of 500, 1,000, 2,000 CVEs every single week. So again, we use AI to help solve this problem. We take that giant list of vulnerabilities, and we ask three questions. First question we ask is, for the code module in question, is it resident in memory? Not is it on the manifest, is it actually running in memory? If it's running in memory, we want to take a closer look. Second question we ask is, is this vulnerability being exploited in the wild? And here we have pretty significant IP. We acquired a company called Kenna Security a few years back. Kenna has AI bots that look at the dark web, we look at Git, we look at chat boards. Are people talking about or using this vulnerability? And then the third thing we understand is because we know that application, we can make an assessment of the business value. Is this the corporate directory with phone numbers or is this something that has consumer credit card numbers or sensitive uh, uh, proprietary information? We roll all of that up into a score and then we create a report that allows your team to say, look, across our entire fleet, private cloud, public cloud, and in this IoT edge world, we see 2,250 Apache servers. But of those 2,250 Apache servers, there's 100 that have this new vulnerability I'm going to call it log 5J. So app team, you need to go qualify the patch for log 5J. But log 4J taught us patching is hard, remember? So it takes a little while. So while you're working on qualifying that patch, don't worry, we will apply a compensating control somewhere in the infrastructure. This is Cisco HyperShield. Now, when that vulnerability gets closed, when the app team updates the app, we will detect that and we'll automatically remove the compensating control. So built-in lifecycle management. Now this capability can protect an application vulnerability, but what's interesting is that the infrastructure itself, it's software, and it too has vulnerability. And I think one of the more notorious forms of vulnerability is in firewalls themselves. So one of our competitors, a hardware firewall vendor, had some CVEs that were pretty significant. So I think it was a 9.6 CVE. Well understood, it was communicated broadly, but firewalls are difficult to upgrade. And so months after the announcement of this vulnerability, we saw nation state actors that were taking advantage of, of and exploiting this vulnerability. So talk about an irony, the device that you're relying on to protect your infrastructure, your firewall, is actually a point of attack. And the reason why this is vulnerable is that for most customers, these are inline, high-performance devices, so they set up two change control windows a year, and that's when you're gonna update your firewall, 4th of July and Christmas. And so that poor firewall administrator has to give up the holiday and try to manage this upgrade, which half the time it doesn't even work. Let's compare and contrast that to the experience in the public cloud. When's the last time that you had to upgrade Amazon or Salesforce? Right, that's not even like, what? What are you talking about? Like it just constantly updates itself. And so one of the innovations that we're delivering with Cisco HyperShield is the ability to take that cloud operating model, this continuous update and evolution, and bring it into premise-based infrastructure. I think this is gonna be a very, very significant development 
that we'll be talking about and working on for years. But you can see it, touch it, and feel it now. So to explain a little bit more about how this magic works, I want to introduce our CTO, my friend, and really the visionary behind Cisco HyperShield, Craig Connors. Craig, please come on up. Hey, man. Hey. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, Craig, let's, let's dive into this a little bit more. If you think about taking a data center and you want to scale it like the public cloud providers did, scale it to AI proportions, I'm going to argue that the firewall is a particularly thorny piece of the infrastructure, yes? And so every firewall on the market, including ours, uh, is billed as a next generation firewall. Craig, in your opinion, professionally, are these next generation devices? Uh, I think that term came out when I was in high school. <laughs> so I'm not trying to peg Craig's age here, but that's more <laughs> than one generation ago, right? So it is true that every firewall on the market was born in a different era. They were born at a time where you, a relationship between the app and the box that it ran on was one to one. And so you could touch those boxes, web server, app server, database, and it was the ethernet cables. And remember the PIX firewall? It was the ethernet cable that you plugged into the device that was the basis for policy. Well, that quickly became IP address, but every modern firewall on the market has at its heart a rule table of IP port and protocol. We call it the five tuple. And every customer in this room has a mature process for how you update that rule table. So if someone on the app team opens a ticket, it goes through security review, it goes through network review, it goes through change control, it goes into staging. Five, 10 days later, the rule gets updated. So rules go into the firewall with a huge amount of energy. Craig, when do the rules come out of a firewall? Uh, one of the customers here told me they have more than 500,000 rules, and a lot of them are written by people who aren't even at the company anymore. So right. I think the answer so is never. Ever. Yeah, yeah, right. And so, so the challenge you have is these rules accumulate and accumulate, and if you look into the rule table, it, it's like assembly code. It's, it's like a bunch of gobbledygook, right? And you might find that, as Craig was saying, the person that wrote those rules has retired, some of those rules might have been written by Benjamin Franklin. I mean, like these things go back a while. <laughs> what are you going to do? So as we think about Cisco HyperShield, I want you to forget everything you know about a traditional firewall. <clears throat> Instead of starting at the bottom of the stack, at the infrastructure layer, let's start at the top of the stack. Let's understand the application. Craig, talk to us about how we understand that application topology. Yeah, so G2 mentioned eBPF, and eBPF's really a game changer here. It's, it's been used by all of those major tools that you use today, Amazon, Google, Meta, Netflix, Cloudflare, and they use it for things like load balancing and DDoS prevention. And what that allows us to do, really, is to safely extend the functionality of the kernel. Historically, if we wanted to extend the functionality of the kernel, we either had to recompile the kernel, or we had to build a kernel module. And then if the kernel module crashed, the whole system would go down with it. Yeah, and that's the heart of the operating system, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, eBPF allows us to do just-in-time compilation, where we take code and we safely can place it in the kernel, because we make sure that it's memory safe, that it won't crash, that it won't cause an infinite loop. And then we can extend the functionality of the kernel at runtime. And what we thought is, what if we took this technology of eBPF and we wrap your applications with eBPF, and we learn not just NetFlow data about your applications, but everything about your applications, every function call, every system call, every file write, every database write, all of that blended together with the network data to build a complete picture of what the application is doing. So we have this detailed understanding of the piece parts that make up an application. Now we want to take security, and we want to put it right next to those pieces. How does that happen? So you, Tom mentioned earlier the different form factors as we take this notion of a security appliance and distill it down into software and spread it throughout the network. And that means we can run it in a variety of different places. We can run it on your native public cloud instances in VM and containerized workloads. We can run it in your private data centers, bare metal servers, VMs, containers. We can run it accelerated in a DPU, like, like G2 talked about earlier. And then in cases where we can't deploy hardware, or don't have hardware that we can use, yeah. we're working with Cisco networking to add intelligent silicon into things like switches yeah. and routers so that we can actually put it into the fabric of the network we're itself. We're taking a network sec security appliance and we're literally melting it into the network. It's not gonna be a separate thing, it's just part of what a network does. 
So this gives us the ability to place security wherever we need. But I'll also argue it allows for more effective security. We can achieve better efficacy. And here's the way I think about it. If you were just looking at packets on the wire, and I asked you, tell me if these are good or bad, Ugh, hard problem, <laughs> right? Tough to really say. But if you could understand where it's coming from and where it's going to, if you had context, if you could understand what we call extended connectivity, the patterns become much more clear. So talk to me, Craig, about how we understand the origination of a connection on a laptop and also the termination on a server. Right. So last year, Cisco introduced technology called Secure Client. And Secure Client is really similar to what we're talking about, because in Secure Client, we worked with Microsoft and Apple to get into the internals of the operating system on your endpoint. You know, classically, as we moved from VPN, which was a world operating on IPs and ports, kind of like the firewall world, we wanted to move to ZTNA, where we could move to a user-to-app, least privilege style mapping for connecting users. But that required putting a proxy in front and, or an app connector, whatever you want to call it. And we couldn't do that for every application. So as a result, most customers, probably most of you in this room, have both ZTNA clients and VPN clients that are serving different use cases. So what we figured out with Secure Client was if we actually understood the applications and we could tell who is the user and what is the application they're accessing inside the endpoint, then we could do that same user-to-app least privilege mapping regardless of whether the transport was ZTNA or VPN. And so now, think of HyperShield as taking a similar concept and bringing it to the server. Instead of just operating on NetFlow data or IPFix data that we're streaming out or looking at packets traversing the network in a firewall, we're right there on the application server next to the application. And we're looking at function calls. We're looking at system calls. We're looking at disk writes. We're looking for patterns of malicious activity all bundled into one entire working system. Yeah, and so this, I'll argue, is a really strategic advantage of Cisco in that we have a presence on the end user device, think laptop, and we have now have a presence on the application or server device, think eBPF uh, and Cilium. And the end-to-end -end view of all the stuff in between, it gives us a context where we can identify in very fine-grained detail lateral movement of an attack. And that's the name of the game. This is what we're looking at for. So Craig, when I describe this to customers, and you know I've been working on this and pitching this for a while, many of you have heard different variants of this from me in the past, the first reaction I get is like, oh my god, this is incredible, but do I have to upgrade and refresh all my hardware to get benefit from this? Can you talk about how the HyperShield fabric works and how it grows? Yeah, so this is entirely software, which is not something you hear very often I from Cisco. Remember that, yes. <laughs> this is entirely software, and it starts with that eBPF layer we talked about. So agents that you can deploy on your bare metal VM or containerized workloads. Of course, agent is a scary word. Nobody likes to deploy agents. So good news, if you're using Cilium as your CNI and service mesh, we're going to embed this functionality directly into Cilium so you don't even have to deploy an agent. Right. It's probably already deployed in your public cloud workloads. Yes. But sometimes we can't get that close to the application. We still need to do enforcement in the network. So we add on top of that virtualized and containerized form factors of this network security appliance. So we can do network-based enforcement upstream in the network. We can run that on a DPU for hardware acceleration. And as we mentioned, we're working to add in the future this directly into the network hardware that already exists in the network. So what we're talking about is a network security device that every Kubernetes cluster, every switch port, becomes a high-performance layer 7 network security device. Now, if you do the math on it, you think, how many kube clusters do I have? How many switch ports do I have? It's a lot, a lot. right? And you're probably thinking, hey, wait a minute. I can't manage 100 or 1,000 firewalls, but we're talking about 100,000 or a million enforcement points. So Craig, how do I manage a million little tiny baby network security devices? You don't. AI does. Yes, exactly. So what we're able to deliver with Cisco HyperShield is the better efficacy that we talked about earlier, but also a much, much better, much more automated administrative experience and better economics. And so we have a classic combination here of better, faster, and cheaper. In fact, what we're talking about 
is a network security device that writes its own rules, it tests its own rules, it deploys its own rules, it lifecycle manages its own rules, and then almost magically, overnight, while you're sleeping, it upgrades itself. Too good to be true? Craig, how does this work? <laughs> it does sound too good to be true. Yes. Uh, so I spent a large part of my career creating an industry called SD-WAN. One of the things that we learned while we created SD-WAN was that embedded devices were not ready for the speed at which software moves. Most of our customers want to upgrade their, their router or their firewall once a year, once every two years. And so the cycle for rolling out new software is slow. Yeah. And part of the reason is that testing is really hard. Yes. For an, um, an embedded device, you see a million different variations of traffic types, feature combinations, policy sets. Right. And tough to replicate in the lab. Tough to replicate in the lab yeah. leads to us taking a long time to test or introducing quality issues when we do roll them out and then upgrades fail, right? So we thought, what if we could take CI CD and the notion of a promotion pipeline or a series of gates yeah. that we go through yeah. and bring that to the embedded world? Yeah. And that's what we've done. Yeah. So inside every enforcement point in HyperShield, there's actually two data planes running in parallel. A primary data plane, which is the one that all of your traffic traverses, and then what we call a shadow data plane, which is essentially a digital twin of your environment running in every single enforcement point. Right. Not in the lab. Every single enforcement point is getting a little digital twin. Now, when a new version of software becomes available, it's placed into the shadow data plane, and we mirror your production traffic through both. And then using AI, we compare the performance of your network going through the current version of code and the new version of code. So now, every possible permutation at every possible customer in the world is being tested to make sure that for your specific environment, when you do an upgrade, it will work the way it's intended. This AI is trained during our QA process to understand the differences between the versions of code, because sometimes memory increases because we added more analytics. Sometimes memory increases because there's a memory leak. It can tell the difference between the two, builds up confidence, and then when you're ready to upgrade, yep. we do that seamlessly in a zero downtime way. Similar to a Kubernetes-style blue-green deployment, we move one flow at a time from the shadow data plane to the primary data plane. Without dropping a packet. Without dropping a packet. Once all of the tra traffic is exiting the new version of code, we bring our AI friend back into the picture. We make sure that everything continues to work uninterrupted in your network. We have kept the last version there for a zero downtime rollback if necessary. Once we are certain that everything is still running seamlessly on the new version of code, we're ready to bring the next set of software and start the cycle all over again. So think about what this means in terms of your day-to-day -day experience. As good as our software is and as proud as we are of this capability, software has bugs, right? It just happens. But with this architecture, they should never see the bug, right? That's right. We may find it in your live production traffic. If we do, we pull it back, we fix it, and deploy it. And it's not until that AI engine says yes that the system rolls over. So very, very, very predictable, very reliable, and I think almost magical approach to infrastructure upgrades. So when we first conceived of this, we thought, oh my gosh, a firewall that upgrades itself. We know what a pain point this is for every single customer. This is magical. So one of the things that Anytime you say you're going to do something autonomously, it's scary, right? I mean, I've been a network administrator my entire life, right. so I know what that's like. Right. We're not asking you overnight to go to this full autonomous self-upgrading mode. When I first got an iPhone, I didn't trust it to upgrade itself. I plugged it into iTunes, and I backed it up, and I made sure everything was safe. And then yeah. when I had a weekend where I was not worried about losing my phone, right. that's when I did the upgrade. Right. But now, it's not like that anymore, right. right? I've built trust in the system. It upgrades overnight while I sleep. Yes. So just like this system can automatically upgrade for you, it can also fit into your existing process. So let's say my process is I use ServiceNow. Well, the outcome of successful verification of software could be for the system to automatically open a ServiceNow ticket for you and attach the release notes and a test results file that explains exactly how we proved that it's working in your environment. Now, when you have your maintenance window, you can still go through the typical 
pre-check, upgrade, post-check. But when you do the upgrade, it's going to be seamless and almost instantaneous. Those maintenance windows are going to get really boring, and eventually you're going to build confidence to start rolling back some of that functionality. Right. So upgrades are going to become highly, highly predictable. Let's talk about policy changes. Right. So policy changes are the other big challenge that we have. Right. We talked about the Ben Franklin rule that we want to remove, but we're scared to. Also, one of the things everyone says, oh, we're going to use AI to generate policies. And that's a pretty scary thing, right? I don't trust AI to generate policies. Well, neither do we. That's why we also use this dual data plane for policy verification. So now imagine both data planes are running the same version of software. And the new policies, whether they're AI recommended or user-driven changes, they can be placed into the shadow data plane. And we will model for you, A, that no software issues are introduced by adding this new policy. Maybe I'm exercising an ALG that wasn't exercised before, and I want to make sure it doesn't disrupt the system. And B, we visualize for you exactly what will change. Yes. So if I take Ben Franklin's rule out, who's allowed that wasn't allowed before? What applications are blocked that used to work? And how does this affect the operation of my network? Yeah. What's exciting about this is it's not synthetic and an analysis of a policy change. It's actual live traffic, right? So you have very, very high confidence that if you're going to make a change, it's going to work. Now, AI is performing this locally. This is a local AI engine that's doing this data plane analysis and making sure we're good to go. But we also have an AI interface at a higher level. Talk about how you interact with the system. Yeah, so everything in the system is backed by a natural language interface. We added an AI assistant to Cisco Defense Orchestrator last December. And this is embedded contextually into every part of the HyperShield UI. So any action that you're doing, whether it's reviewing a CVE or doing these self-qualifying upgrades, you've got an AI that's trained in the area that you're looking on. So you can ask it, how do you know I'm vulnerable to this exploit? What is the exploit? What does the exploit do? What does the compensating control do? How are you, you going to stop this attack? You can ask it to deploy the compensating control. You can ask it to prove to you that it's working all through natural language. Yeah, amazing. So this is Cisco HyperShield. It is a subscription software. It has the base platform. It does the automatic autonomous segmentation. It protects your applications from vulnerabilities. It upgrades itself. Software that is independent of the hardware. The good news is right around the corner. So general availability is August of this year. Right? So right in front of us. And we're going to have early customer engagement in May. So many of you in the room, if you want to put your hands on it, you can actually touch it. It is software. It is a subscription service. We offer it per workload and also per port pricing if you're doing network enforcement. Uh, and it's independent of hardware. So thank you all for listening. This is Cisco HyperShield. I'm going to turn it back over to G2. We'll wrap it up. G2? Thanks, thank buddy. you, guys. There you go. All right, so we're going to wrap it up. Thank you for being patient. But here's what I want you to take away from this. We have fundamentally reimagined security for the AI scale data center. And if you think about a lot of the vulnerability, or a lot of the breaches that have happened, even in the recent past, a lot of those could have been prevented were they using HyperShield. A lot of them. And uh, what I want you to take away is, what we've built will get us to a world where you never have to upgrade because you'll have self-qualifying updates, you will have autonomous segmentation, and you'll have a distributed exploit protection that can happen at a very, very fast pace and speed. Thank you all. <laughs>